Okay, yeah, I'm I'm just going to introduce Josh and it was just one of those really weird serendipity moments. I worked with Josh's mum in another charity and I was just talking about Ree Betchworth and she said, oh, I've got just the bloke for you. Sorry, Josh. <laughs> um, which is brilliant because we don't have the expertise um, in insect identification. And that's been my passion to not only increase the flower biodiversity, but actually recognize what that means in terms of um, increasing the amounts of uh, insects that come into our gardens and being able to identify the impact that we're having. So um, it's absolutely brilliant to have Josh on board. And thankfully he's really keen and enthusiastic. <laughs> And I didn't bend his arm and he had no pressure from his mum. Did you, Josh? <laughs> yeah. So Josh has got a degree in ecology and works in a local ecology consultancy, which he's been doing since 2019. And he's a very keen bird watcher. And he's also a licensed bird ringer with the British Trust for Ornithology, which I'd love to find out more about that, Josh. And he volunteers at Net Rewilding Project, which is is I think widely recognized nationally as, a, as an amazing place. And he helps with breeding bird surveys and white stalk reintroduction. So we are actually really, really lucky to have him on our patch, although he doesn't actually live in Betchworth or Buckland. So we're extremely lucky to have him with us. Um, and Josh is gonna talk about the insect survey he started on behalf uh, for us with the Beeline project. So over to you, Josh, and thank you. Josh, you, do you want me to give you, let you share a screen too, or are you just going to talk? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll be sharing my screen. Um, yeah, okay. bear with me, get it all set up. Right, hopefully everyone can see that okay. Yeah. All good? Yes. That's all good. Okay, brilliant. All right, yeah, hi guys. Um, yes, as Camilla said, my name's Josh. Um, and thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, so this project was something that I was really excited to get involved with, really, mainly because I'd lived in the village for 25 years. I only recently moved to, to Guildford, so... Yeah, this is something that was really appealing for me. Um, it's a nice nature positive project. Um, there's a lot of doom and gloom in the world at the moment. So I thought this would be, uh, yeah, a really good thing to get involved with. Um, so yeah, in my role as an ecologist, I carry out a lot of habitat and protected species surveys. So um, insects don't often come into it. So that was another reason why I wanted to sort of improve my skills as well as um, being able to provide some good data for the project. So um yeah i do lots of various surveys bird surveys bat surveys um surveys for badgers dormice otters water voles reptiles and amphibians um so yeah um inverts aren't something that we get in a consultancy setting very often just because they don't really have the same level of protection as those other animal groups that i've just mentioned so th there are a few the uh, European designated species. So for example, the ram's horn whirlpool snail is a European designated species. And that was actually found on a development site down in Horsham recently and ended up putting a stop to the whole thing. Um, so yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, not something I do very often, but I'm definitely a hobbyist and it's something that I'm very interested in. So yeah, I'm really happy to be involved. Um, so yeah, just to give a quick overview of what I'm gonna cover this evening. Um, so some of the main reasons as to why you'd monitor insect populations or invertebrate populations more broadly. Um, the types of sampling methods for each of those groups. Um, so it's gonna mainly cover terrestrial as we're talking about a project focusing on pollinators um, um, rather than any of the aquatic invertebrate species. So yeah, I'm then gonna give a quick overview of the beeline sites. So, Norman's done this already, so I won't spend too long doing that, but just to give you a, a bit of insight as to where, where I've been surveying um, and yeah, some of the early stage results that we've got. And then to, to finish off, I was just going to 
provide some useful identification resources and tips that can hopefully encourage members who have signed up to this project um, yeah, to get involved and to, to help get better data for them and the project, I guess. Okay, so why do we want to monitor insect or invertebrate populations? So one of the main reasons, um, as Norman's alluded to, is the current declines in insect populations. So this was actually a study done by Bug Life, so Louis may want to fact check me on this, but um, yeah, it was uh, the Bugs Matter um, survey. So that reported a 60% decline in all flying insects over the past 20 years. Um, and this is mainly as a result of climate change, pesticide use, habitat loss and fragmentation and also air and light pollution has been sort of reported to have an impact on insect populations as well. So um, yeah, another reason um, is that they are very good indicators of um, climate and habitat changes. So this is obviously very prevalent in this day. Um, and as they are such good indicators, it's always a good thing to, to get the baseline surveys done. So at the point before any interventions has happened. So I know with, with NEP, there was a, a lot of baseline surveys done. These are essentially the most important because if you don't know what you're working with from the start, then you don't know how to measure your, your successes or, or failures. Um, yeah, so they also are huge providers of ecosystem services as the project is looking to enhance. We know they're very good pollinators. We know they're decomposers. They're the base of the food chain. So yeah, provide a food source for, for bats, birds, and, and many other animal groups. And essentially, if we, didn't, we don't have these insect populations and all other life on earth will cease to exist. So. Um, Yes, and then finally, common standards monitoring. So this is um, a monitoring um, process that's used to determine the condition of designated sites. So things like SACs, triple SIs. I know there's one locally to you, Norman, the Brockham Limeworks triple SI. So these sorts of surveys would usually be done to inform man management plans to ensure that things like insects are, are thriving on those sites. Um, okay, yes, so invertebrate sampling methods, um, as I said earlier, most inverts are not protected and therefore no license is needed to survey for them. Um, however, yeah, as I mentioned, there are, there are a few that are protected, so ramshorn, whirlpool, snail, and the fishers, estuarine moth, which have very restricted ranges and therefore, um, yeah, highly protected. The um, Roman snail is also on Schedule 5 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act, so um, yeah, there are a few, but but not many. So essentially, anyone can go out and do these surveys, providing you follow this code of conduct that's um, linked at the top there. So this is essentially a widely cited good practice guidelines for insect collecting, and it's published by the Royal Entomolog Entomological Society. And this just covers a load of different points, basically, about how you should go about your work if you are collecting specimens for use in, in research. Um, and these include things like gaining landowner access permission, um, ensuring that you take no more specimens than are required for a specific purpose. Um, where species are easily identified, they should not be killed or removed from the wild. And species that do not occur in abundance or species that are of conservation concern should not be taken from the same site um year on year essentially um yes and they also state that they should not be collected with the intention to sell um and all of the early stages of the life cycle of an inverse which should not be taken so that a population can still exist um and then the next bit of documentation there that you see on the screen surveying terrestrial and freshwater invertebrates for conservation evaluation now this is the documentation that I've been following for the surveys within the beeline. So this is something that was used pretty widely in ecological consultancy to assess a site for its value for invertebrates. And this basically covers site selection. So ensuring that you're covering all of the high value areas of a site. So things like woodland glades or rides, areas of dense scrub, wildflower meadows, that sort of thing. Um, it determines the number of visits that you should make and the time of year. So most surveys will 
require at least one visit a month between the, the um, months of April and September just to account for the different um, stages of the life cycle of an invertebrate. And then number of samples. Now, ideally, the more samples, the better, uh, the more species you're going to accumulate and the better idea of the habitat quality and condition you, you're going to get from those results. Um, it's not always um, easily doable with a with a tough survey schedule during the summer months for an ecologist, but yeah, one, one visit a month is usually the go-to. Um, and then finally, repeatability is obviously a, a massive thing as well. So this year, we are focusing on the baseline surveys for all these sites, but we want to be able to, um, yes, um compared them with following years essentially to see how the project is progressing so i am just going to now go over some of the more common methods of surveying inverts um again i'll be focusing more on terrestrial inverts but and mainly insects but i'll also co cover some methods that are, are good for things like spiders and um that sort of thing as well so firstly, transects. Now these are very commonly used for butterflies and bees. They're not very labor intensive and they essentially involve walking a set route that's divided into separate sections. And then within those sections, you are looking at the diversity of species, the abundance, and then comparing them between each section while also recording the climatic conditions. So some good examples of these are UK butterfly monitoring scheme, which has been running since 1976. Um, and then also the Bumblebee Conservation Trust Bee Walks, which has been running since 2008. So I think the key thing to say here as well is that these can also be carried out in conjunction with, with sweep nets and butterfly nets. So you can use um, cameras as well to take photos, but it's, it's a less invasive way of way of um, surveying and you can also do egg search as well so we're looking for the where butterflies have laid eggs for example you might be looking on blackthorn for for black hair streak and brown hair streak butterfly eggs while doing these transects um moth traps now this is something that is probably one of my favorite things to do um i have my own trap that I made for my dad actually during my degree, which is really enjoyable. Um, so there are actually 2,500 species of moth in the UK and their their role in um, pollination is, is greatly underestimated. So some recent research has found that moths are actually more efficient pollinators than some day flying insects. This is mainly because they're out for far less hours, um, but they're pollinating just as many flowers as day flying insects so um, they tend to pollinate them at a faster rate um, so yes yeah, important to to reiterate the um, the value of moths in pollinating because I think bees and butterflies get a lot of a lot of the headlines um, and for example greater and lesser butterfly orchids actually rely exclusively on moths for for pollination so the common ways of monitoring these um, species are light traps. So the first image at the top there is just a sheet that's been strung across a branch and a torch or light shone on it and the, the moths will come to this. Um, this is because they, um, they um, are positive phototaxic. So that basically means they, they move towards the light and this is generally because they'll be able to get more food and also um, it's been alluded as because they use the moon to navigate so that they're also attracted to light for this reason. Um, so yeah these are really good things to, to get involved with um, and they're quite easy to do. You can literally just use like a bed sheet strung over a washing line and, and a torch so it doesn't have to be expensive um, and they are yeah yeah as i said really really fun to do once you collect them in the morning so they're generally um consist of a box like the image in the top right corner and a collecting area which is filled with egg boxes 
and then you, you can use a range of different light bulbs but um the one i have is a, a mercury vapor bulb which is an incredibly bright so I, I would recommend if you are interested in doing this within your gardens to maybe not do it every night you might annoy the neighbors <laughs> um okay then moving on to sugaring so this is this is quite a nice way to survey moths as well it's fairly low cost as well you literally can just make a little mix of treacle um some people use alcohol as well and brush it on a tree or um any other piece of vegetation really and then wait for the moths to come and find it um and then a lot of people also can use pheromone traps as well so that does attract a lot of male moths so particularly during the breeding season um sweep netting and pooters so this is what i've been mainly using when surveying the sites within the bee line um they are very easy to use and consist of using a, a figure of eight motion walking through tall vegetation um making sure you avoid any brambles but they're essentially a canvas net and they will collect any any bees flies um spiders they're, they're pretty good generalist way of of surveying for for inverts so this is what i've been yeah mainly using um once you've collected your sample as you can see in the photo in the, the middle the guy's got the bag over his his head so where i said they are f positively phototaxic you have to do that and then put the um the bag up to the light so that they move um upwards into the bag rather than flying out of the bag into your face otherwise you're just going to lose all of your sample um so yeah once once you've got your your head in the bag you then use the pooter to to suck up any of the the inverts that you've that you've collected and this is a malaise trap so this is most commonly used to target flies um it's essentially a tent with a collecting pot at the top there you can see um so the insects fly in towards the top um attracted by a pheromone and then they are usually killed um, unfortunately, just because flies are incredibly difficult to identify if you haven't um, um, killed them. So, yeah. And then moving on. So these are less suitable for our pollinating insects, but um, are really good if you are looking to survey things like spiders or, or ground beetles. So it, again, really easy, low cost, just walking around. If you're seeing any interesting ecological features, then you, you get down in the ground um, and yes, yeah, you're just sieving through basically. Pitfall traps. These are again, another good one for, for ground beetles. So um, again, they usually contain a um, an ethanol based liquid that, that kills the insects once, it, once they've fallen in. Um, and you can use um, a lid over the top of them as well to prevent them filling up with rainwater. What I would say about these is that it's good to check them as soon as you can after deploying them. So ideally the next next morning so that, um, yeah, more the more predatory beetles won't have eaten everything else that's in your sample. And then moving on to vacuum sampling. So this is not something that I've actually used myself. This is it's basically a an industrial scale pooter, um, basically a hoover. So you just walk through the vegetation, it's able to get really large sample sizes in a short amount of time. And then they're then taken away to a lab to, to identify. So looking at the sites that I've been surveying, these are the ones that, that um, Norman has already given us a brief overview of. Um, I haven't actually had a chance to survey all of them yet as we're still fairly early in the season and trying to fit surveys in around um yeah busy work schedule so the ones that i have actually surveyed so far are norman's garden the wildflower strip on goulburn green number seven and the meadow by the river mole so a nice range of management schemes and at different stages of the of the process um so yeah as, as i said it is very early stages um within norman's garden i've actually recorded over 70 species of grass and wildflower 
and that was just within a day of being there. So I think it really shows that even at that baseline stage of just letting your your lawn grow, that you can get a huge diversity of plants, and that's only going to be good for supporting a, a big diversity of insects as well. So these images here are some of the ones that I've recorded from from Norman's garden mainly. Um, so we've got a drone fly in the top left there um on an oxide daisy we've got a crab spider the next one along to the right which is really cool i don't know if any of you have seen those before but they essentially mimic the color of the flower that they're on and they can change change their color pretty rapidly within hours um i'd recommend googling a, a video of that and they ambush their prey on them um they also do pollinate not as effectively as bees and, and flies that sort of thing but when they're, they're on those flowers they, they do transfer pollen between them um we've also got common car to be there and an early bumblebee so yeah these are the early flying species we've got a early mining bee as well in the top right um we've got a parasitoid wasp there with the long ovipositor which they essentially use to lay eggs in the in the nests of of other um pollinating species we've then got a five spot burnet moth um so this this actually pollinates bird's foot trefoil which norman has loads of in his garden at the moment um yeah and that's a that's a day flying moth that one and then in the bottom right we've got a thick leg flower beetle so these are also pretty common i would imagine a lot of you will get those in your garden once your little wildflower areas have established um yeah so in terms of evaluating the results within a consultancy setting what you would usually use is a an application called Pantheon. So this is something that's been produced by Natural England and, and DEFRA, and it's a, an online tool that is used to assess invertebrate assemblages. So what that basically means is um, they would get a species list for the site, so taken from April to August, and then put that into this application, and then that would tell them the, the quality of the site, the condition, and any um, sort of habitat habitat indicators and that will allow them to inform any management regimes on top of that okay so moving on um norman mentioned that, that some surveys are coming up in the next month or so the first first visit for members of the the beeline um and this this uk pollinator monitoring scheme is something that I think would be really great for people to get involved with it's it's quite easy and you, you don't have to identify things to species level so it's it's um as well um so it's yeah funded by the uk center for ecology and hydrology and jncc and is also um supported by project partners including butterfly conservation the bto bug life and bumblebee conservation trust um, and what it essentially is, is a flower insect time count or fit count. So these literally take 10 minutes and would require members of the project to, to watch a flower for 10 minutes and see how many visits um, they get. And you can do that as many times or as, or as little as you want. So it's, it's yeah, brilliant, really. Um, yeah, so they have a list of 14 target flowers that they ideally like you to watch these flowers for. But... They, they also say that if, if you don't have those flowers in your garden, then that's, that's not an issue and you can still take part. And yeah, your, your results can be submitted either on an online app or on a recording form. So just to finish off, um, to hopefully give you, you guys some good ID resources to help you during this project um, to monitor the, the sites as they, as they improve. Um, so ID guides, obviously a massive one. My favourites are, are wild guides. You can get those on any any good bookstore, really. But NHBS, the Natural History Bookstore, is really good, and they also do the FSC charts, the, the Field Studies Council ones. So their little pullouts are, are really good and easy to transport in the field. Um, mobile apps as well are particularly useful. So. They're becoming ever more powerful. Um, I, I use iNaturalist a lot and submit all of my my recordings on there. If there's something that you don't know, then there will be a specialist in, say, I don't know, crane flies that will be able to ID that for you. Um, 
seek is another one so that's also made by a naturalist um is essentially it opens up a camera on your phone and you can scan it over an insect or, or plant or, or anything really and it will buzz up with an id um and the same thing goes for the google lens app as well um and then social media i found is also a really useful tool so there's a group dedicated to pretty much every invertebrate or insect group on on facebook and everyone is like, very willing to help you out with identification no matter your, your your level so that's another good one to use and then the royal entomological society also have a submission page so if you don't get any hits on any of those previous ones that i've spoken about then you can submit that to them and, and get an expert opinion on those as well um whatsapp group i thought this might be a good idea for the project and maybe something that you guys have already thought about or already have but um i think that'd be great ever to get the 40 members that are involved in the project in a whatsapp group um so that they can share their their um, findings and compare and hopefully help each other out with ids as it's probably quite likely if one person's getting in their garden in in brockham then someone in betchworth is probably going to get the same thing um yeah, and then just a couple of other citizen science, science projects that people could get involved with as well. The Big Butterfly Count um, has been running for many years and also Bug Life, the Bugs Matter Survey, which I'm sure Louis could probably tell you a bit more about. Um, but I think there's a, a repeat study coming up this year, potentially, um, which is essentially involves putting a sticky label on your, your number plate and then recording how many insects are, are getting attached to that during your journeys and then comparing to to previous years um yeah so, so that's that's me um hopefully that's given you a bit of an overview of the, the methods that you can use to sample invertebrates and more specifically insects and pollinators um mm -hmm. and hopefully given you some yeah some good pointers so that you can get involved in within your own gardens as well and um yeah really reap the the rewards of all the hard work that Norman and Camilla have um, yeah, been putting in to, to get this project underway. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. You could stop sharing the screen. That would be great. We can go back to There you go. And it, so we, we, when is the big butterfly count? So do you remember the date of Yes, I believe it's in July. Uh, I'm not sure on a specific date. Um, I can have a look at that for you and, and get back to you. And did you say there's 70 species of grass in Norm 70? Is that what you said? Uh, of, of grass and wildflower and, and forbs, yeah. Yeah, just within that oxide daisy meadow that you've seen pictures of there, yeah. So, yeah, there was a, um, an image of a common tway blade, which is, uh, yeah, a nice orchid species as well, which is which is great. No, over to you. Um, well, I, I'm amazed <laughs> that you found 70 species, Josh. Well done. Um, I, mean, I was out there today looking for orchids, and I found about three species and a lot of bee orchids this year, which I, I, found, I only found two last year, but I found six today, just um, but without any trouble. So I think orchids are definitely on the increase. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. I mean, that was great. Um, I had just one question, and um, we haven't discussed this, but I just wondered whether you would be happy if people photographed insects for them just to send them to you um, as part of a bigger picture rather than just focusing on the individual sites. Is that something that you would be happy to do? Yes, of course, 100%. I think if that WhatsApp group was something that we could get going, then everyone could just post their, their um, recordings in there and everyone can get involved, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the WhatsApp group is a good idea. We haven't discussed it, but um, I don't know what uh, Miller and Deb think about that. I think there's a number of things we need to work on from this and sort of say, how, how do we best do that? And most you should, without involving Josh, you know, overloading him, but, but getting the goodwill, but not the rest of it. And what are we, we've got, we've, we've got Louis here. How are we going to use the fact that we've got the bug life person who got us involved in the first place on this call? Is there something, Louis, why don't you come in and, this, uh, in and make any comments about what you've heard here and what, how that compares with what's happening elsewhere? 
Yeah, I just um just great to see all the work everyone's been doing. And um it's great to be involved with a with a project um filled with such motivated um and driven people that have you know got so many people in the community on board as well as businesses. It's um really shows what what can be done. So um yeah, thanks. It's been been a pleasure to be a part of that. Um and yeah, I think in terms of, it's really exciting to see that you're already looking at recording. I think um, from our experience, we wish we had the time and money to, and um, project timelines fit in to allow us to do more recording ourselves. Um, we do do stuff, but it can be inconsistent depending on when we're doing. Josh was talking about baseline surveys there often. From this project, for example, we come in and you know it's already a habitat work season and so you have to just get on with stuff so it's really nice to see that um you've been proactive with that and um i think as conservation professionals we often uh <clears throat> stand up on tv and talk about what invertebrates are doing in terms of food production and soil quality and all of this that and the other but i think you know actually when we speak to people um like many of the people in this group that love invertebrates and are already on the message it's actually going out there interacting with them finding them learning about them that actually builds that connection and gets people on side in reality um so i think you know go and give it a go and i'm sure you know you'll 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 many of you will get hooked so um yeah and then lastly um uh, bugs matter did come up a few times um in that so um yes it's launched again as of last week so june july august um if you want to get the app we're now completely paperless as well um and it's quite you know if you can work your head around the app it's quite low effort you know you just count the splats on your number plates um when you're doing the journeys that you'd be doing anyway and that's really helpful and um yeah it's 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 given some pretty devastating results unfortunately um you know in that 2004 to 2022 timeline we're looking at a drop off of 75 percent in flying insects in wales uh 68 percent in england um and less but 16 percent still in scotland and um we we got enough data in last year to do northern ireland for the first time and 41 percent drop off as well so um you know it's important that we're keeping our eyes on that so you know go and go and make every journey count thank you thank you well I, everyone would have heard the, the use of the citizen science on this call and there's another one which i had i think from you probably which you, or what the sorry wildlife trust event which you were speaking at which is bio blitz so um whether we can get more people involved in the village and some of the citizen science and doing some of the legwork and using some of these apps to do the recording to help Josh's survey, we'll, we'll look in, we'll absolutely look into that. We've got a meeting, briefly, team meeting tomorrow, so we'll go from there. Norman, what else do we need to cover? Uh, do we do a plug for the Wildflower Wonder? Absolutely. Will you do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I mentioned it uh, in my talk that we're planning on National Meadows Day on July the 1st to have two walks in the afternoon. Um, they'll be about one hour and they'll start at Knight's Garden Centre, wander up the hill um, uh, through my garden and um, a neighbour's garden, and then back down the hill past Knight's and end up in James and Claire's garden. And these are all sites where we're hoping there'll be plenty of wildflowers to see and plenty of pollinators to photograph. Um, so we're running twice in the afternoon and Knights are very kindly offering to provide a drink to everybody who comes on the walk. Limited Numbers will be limited to 20 on each of the two walks. So, um, and we'll be advertising that very, very shortly. Thank you. Any, thank you Norman for that. Any questions from anyone? Thank you all for staying to the fisher ends. Um, can I just ask what's happening about the verges? Because I see that some of them are now being cut. Yes, that's an interesting question because I, I got in touch with the Highways Authority uh, a couple of months ago and they said, 
very, very unlikely that they will be cut before July. So, you know, that was the assurance I got. And then, yes, yeah, this weekend I looked down the round the roundabout and everything seems to be cut within an inch of its life. So Yeah, it's it's quite spread it though. It's not it's not particularly in not any everywhere. sort of order. There's obviously a policy around the roundabout. There's certain lines which I think they've cleared the sight lines, um, and then they've left others. So, yeah, mm. there's, there's obviously some planning gone into it, some design. <laughs> yeah, Just Norman, it's Alan. I can probably help there. Um, uh, Jim Gear in Pebble Hill Road is quite active, and I think he's had several requests from residents about kids crossing the roundabout and mm. the lack of. And I think that's what's driven cutting right. down by the roundabout. Right. Thank you, Alan. Actually, uh, w w while I'm talking, if I could, um, James and Norman, uh, since you visited the Wild Cross several months ago, we've let all the paddocks go wild with some reasonable success. Mm -hmm. um, the back of the pond, which was, was construction on it last year, there's a fair bit of, I think, I'm a bit of a novice, um, germination going on. The area that so far is a bit disappointing was all the Wildcroft Large Pond spoil that went on the paddock near the railway line. It hasn't done much. I think that's because it's gone straight onto clay, as you were alluding mm -hmm. to earlier on. But I guess the final request is when you find yourself down this neck of the woods, pop by and I'd certainly appreciate your uh, input again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Thank you much. On. Well, uh, it's two minutes to eight o'clock. We normally try and finish then. So uh, thanks to everyone for coming. Thank you very much, Louis, particularly for bookending your start of the day with BBC Breakfast and us at the end of the day. We feel honoured. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Josh, thank you too. Really interesting. Good to have you working with us. Thanks, Camilla, for twisting the arm. And Norman, for everything you've done for this. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Yeah. See you, I hope, on July the 1st. Thank you, James. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.